the, the prize of furthest distance traveled uh, goes to Yvonne Kingman, who started the day in uh, Southern California and uh, is, is here, though, uh, to talk to us. Uh, Yvonne is the Director of Corporate Communications at uh, the California Water Service, AKA Cal Water. Um, and she's uh, been with the company, like a lot of people at Cal Water, she's been with the company uh, 19 years. Um, and Yvonne is responsible for uh, creating, managing strategic customer communications, crises, there's always crises, um, media relations, social media, employee communications efforts. Um, in addition to Cal Water, you know, throughout the groups, uh, districts throughout California, Yvonne supports its parent company, Cal, Cal Water Service Group, uh, when the group's subsidiaries in Hawaii, Mexico, Texas, and Washington. Um, and uh, she's a Texas native, uh, went to UT at Austin, and uh, um, uh, is uh, as accreditation in public relations with the Public Relations Society of America. Knows a few things about crises, so take it away, Yvonne. Uh, no, it's a oh, is it a view? Either way, too many yeah, legs. It's, it's like weeds, you know. Weeds often is kind of a frame of mind. So let me. Oh. Give this. Some well, it's going to be my frame in my frame of eyesight we'll, during this we'll thing. Coax, we'll <laughs> All right, thank you so much. It's great to be here with you all today. Um, it's The weather is a lot nicer here than it is in Southern California right now, but it's also great because I can wear a coat and not look silly. Um, but yes, thank you for that introduction. I'm glad to talk to you guys today about maintaining drought mindfulness. I mean, because in the room, we all know that droughts are cyclical and we all understand the importance of um, making sure we build long-term resiliency and have long-term water supplies. But in my world, it's important for us to make sure that our external audiences, uh, like our customers, media, and then what my colleague Rob Seeley handles is our elected officials and community leaders, uh, make sure that they keep drought and water conservation top of mind, whether in dry or wet years. And I want to share some of the challenges that we faced as a company, both in dry and wet years, um, such as we ended up having a wet winter. There's drought fatigue, and people are tired of hearing about it. And there are 18 million other things that people have to do in their day um, to worry about. So, um, but really, we had some opportunities with that. Um, and I want to share what we worked on and how we're still working to make sure that our customers, our media, members of the media, elected officials, community leaders, um, still keep this top of mind and, and understand the importance of it. But first, I'd like to introduce um, myself and my company to you. For those of you who are not familiar, I work for California Water Service, as Dennis mentioned. We have 24 distinct uh, conservation districts in California. We serve up and down the state from Chico in the north down to the Palos Verdes Peninsula in Carson and this in the south, uh, which is south of LA. And we have uh, almost 500,000 customer connections among these service areas for a population of about two, over two million people served. Uh, Dennis gave you my bio, so I don't need to go over it again, but I put a picture of my kids because they are way cuter than me. One's 13, one's 16, and then I have my COVID puppy who is almost three. And she is the only one of the three that does not have an attitude. So. so I will say, and I have notes up here, so I don't forget to tell you all of these wonderful things I want to inflict on you today. I have been with Cal Water for 20 years, almost 20 years. So while I wasn't around for the drought in, in the early 90s, I was here for the last time we, we went through this in uh, 2015, 2016. So we had some lessons learned and I had the, the luxury of being able to oversee drought communications during that time as well. So we had a little practice for what we went through over the last couple of years. And it's definitely easier to message when things look like this outside. Um, this is how 2022 started. 
And in all of our districts within a six month period, we entered stage two of our water shortage contingency plan, which meant 24 meetings, materials out to all 500,000 of our customers, and letting them know about new restrictions that would be in place. Um, but the important thing during that time was to make sure they knew we were customer first. And that was the approach we were taking. Um, so while we were telling people what we needed them to help us do, we also wanted to make sure it was important that they knew what we are doing on our end. So it's not just you do this, but we are doing this as well and together we can accomplish so much more and this is a partnership. In stage two for us, really it was um, the addition of uh, restricted irrigation days and um, increased penalties. So our penalties for water waste doubled. Um, we already had the, the time irrigation restrictions in place. But with all predictions last year leading to another dry winter, we started wondering in certain ones of our service areas, because um, our service areas are, di are really diverse, uh, we, we go from urban to rural, affluent to low income, um, large to small, and then those that are 100% groundwater driven to those that are 100% surface water driven. Um, but in certain ones of our areas, we started, in certain of our service areas, we started wondering, are we going to have to move into stage three of our water shortage contingency plans and implement water budgets? But thank the Lord, it rained. And I think I'm probably not the only one who felt like this. Um, it's like, hallelujah, we don't have to tell people we're implementing water budgets. But then this, uh, this created its own set of challenges because people are like, it rained. Why do we need to save more water? Why are you, um, what are you doing to capture all this water? But that's another conversation for another day. And now there's another what winter predicted. So why are you, water utility, still on me about conserving water? So we started messaging for the long term. And we know that people have shorter attention spans these days, and I think it's getting shorter and shorter because back in the day, we were creating content that would span five minutes. And then we had to start shortening it to about three minutes. And now we're at 15 seconds, and that's not an exaggeration because our testing showed that when we have 15 second videos up, the engagement and the, the completion rate that we have is so much greater, like considerably greater than a 30 second video. Like people won't even watch a 30 second video anymore. And like my 16 year old, she can't even listen to a full song. When she's on TikTok, she's listening to a song and I start getting into the song and then she changes it because she gets bored and like 20 seconds in. So I can't, I'm like mid lyric and I can't finish my song. It's like when you're watching TV and your spouse or your partner takes the remote and you're getting really into your show and then they change a the channel. And you're like, well, what happened? I was watching that. So that's like literally what my life is like. But <laughs> I don't think that I'm, um, uh, that I'm an anomaly here and, and um, clearly we're seeing that you, we have to keep the content short. So you've got 15 seconds to hit people with the information you need. And they're forgetful and they forget that, that droughts are cyclical and that we live in a traditionally drier climate. And so what we have done is start messaging for the long term. Um, it is more challenging because we, our focus group studies have found that um, people actually don't care as much about having plen plenty of water like generations down the line. Like people are actually saying, well, that's for my grandkids to worry about. I'm concerned about what's happening right now. And as much as people in my world, in the PR world, love to, to have all this warm, fuzzy messaging, we have actually found that people respond better to emergencies and when they think they're gonna run out of water and when, when there's a problem. So they respond better to the scarier language. So we have been saying, you know, we live in a, a traditionally drier climate and our changing climate means that, you know, we're going to see more frequent and severe weather patterns. And so we're using words like frequent, severe, extreme, things like that, while we're still cushioning it a little bit. Um, so that's how, how we're approaching that. And then there's drought fatigue. And this little guy looks, looks like how I think most of our customers felt, and they're over it. And they're tired about hearing about it. But how do we then beat this drought fatigue? Well. We all know that people like talking about other people 
and themselves. And we also know that people like to recognize other people and themselves. So we had uh, one of our best, actually best received um, interactive campaigns that we ran earlier this year while it was still rainy out was called our Water Hero Minute. And we partnered with Odyssey, a, a conglomerate of radio stations, to run a Water Hero Minute over a two month period in our Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Sacramento markets, where we have um, you know, a handful of districts in each of those, those radio markets. So the radio stations would put out a call for nominations, hey, do you know a water hero? Let's recognize them and they'll, they'll get to hear you know, whoever the winner is on the air. And so we had people nominating their neighbors or their family members, or in some cases themselves. And then they would actually be the water hero of the week and it would run for a full week. So we had radio stations at the same time that they're putting out a call for nominations, also running a water hero of the week and that'd be called the water hero minute. And these spots ran all throughout the day, but particularly during prime drive times. So um, we would, people would actually get to hear themselves and it was kind of, they got excited. We asked our community leaders and our elected officials to help us promote this um, because they really like having a hero that's in, who is in their, their district or in their area. And it was a really strategic way for us to be able to engage with our community leaders. So uh, at the same time, we were promoting it ourselves too via like email and social media. Um, and I'll just mention that uh, the radio stations also promoted it on their social media and then of course over the radio. And then here in, San Francisco, in the San Francisco or in the Bay Area, uh, the station who, that ran these spots was KCBS AM and FM and here, uh, they also did a, a, an in-depth interview with one of our conservation coordinators named Anthony Meyer um, and sat down with him for a good amount of time and, and ran a spot with him. So that was awesome. And finally, how do we reach people and get them to care amid the 18 gazillion other things that you have going on in your life every single day with your job, with your kids, with carpool, with your, your pet, and anything else you might be doing. So there are people who are motivated by doing the right thing, which is fantastic. So I want to save the planet, and hey, maybe I'll save money at the same time. That's awesome. But then there are a lot of people who are more motivated by money, and so we're like, hey, save money. And while you're at it, you'll get to save the planet too. And in our own Water Hero Minute, we're here to help. So we offered and, and really promoted our rebate programs, which we uh, doubled the amount, of the, the amount of the rebates for. Uh, partners who can help you get your message out um, while, while you're teaching them at the same time. And then of course also through the media because um, there's an ongoing debate is media an audience or a channel and I believe strongly that they're both. And they can help you um, really reach folks um, if they understand what you're talking about. So, Looking ahead, even if uh, we don't have another drought for a while, we've got these long-term regulations coming that we have to meet. So teaching our customers and, and keeping it top of mind for them now and throughout the time will help better prepare them for when we have to meet these long-term regs. And, but the entire time, we're going to stay customer first, customer focused, and provide individualized water targets, which are voluntary, no, no monetary penalties associated with that, and then expanding our conservation programs. And at the same time, it'll be important to make sure that we and you know, other agencies who, who do this also educate your own employees because sometimes they are the ones who are forgotten or get, get kind of lost because you're so focused on your external audiences. It's important that you educate your employees so that they know what's happening, what you offer, the, reasons thing, the reason why you're doing, taking certain actions as an agency because they can be the best advocates and ambassadors for you. So that's, I tried to talk fast because I didn't want to go over time and get 
I didn't want to get the sign. Yeah, <laughs> so with that, I'm actually happy to take questions. Our water hero of the minute, that particular campaign wasn't more so geared toward kids because it was on the radio, so it was more so geared toward like adults um, and families too. We saw a lot of families um, nominating their family members. Um, but one thing about kids is because they are, you know, obviously some of our best ambassadors because they'll go home and they'll teach their parents about conserving water if they don't care. Or they'll hold their parents accountable. So we have a school education program for that and where, where people within our districts will go out to the schools and help educate them, you know, whether it's upper elementary, lower elementary, or even high school. Um, we have various presentations and interactive um, types of programs with them. And we also have like a whole school challenge that's getting adjusted, you know, in the coming year for, but we've been doing it for nine, 10 years now. And it was a whole project-based learning um, competition for classrooms. And then there's the ever, the ongoing debate of, of if we get on TikTok, no, <laughs> which, which I have my own opinion about. Yes. Uh, so, so this is great. I was wondering if you had some sense of how effective the different programs were in terms of your per capita water use over time. Uh, how close did you come to meeting the state target of 15% reduction? What's more effective, less effective? Uh, I don't know if you have any numbers about that. Um, we, we did actually meet the state 15% um, call for, for a reduction. And we feel like it was a combination of all of our efforts because like I was mentioning how our, our audiences receive information in different ways. So there are certain campaigns in which you can evaluate better on um, output versus outcome because in certain spots you can get, um, you can only get impression data versus engagement data. But we would go through in all of our campaigns and and look against benchmark for the industry. Um, and industry being like companies. It, it couldn't segment all the way down to like water industry, but we always made sure we were above benchmark. Um, otherwise, we would be tailoring uh, some of our assets, like not, not anything conservation related, but we had another campaign that was about affordability and, and customer assistance programs. And we found that part of one specific component that was on Facebook was a little bit below benchmark. So then you go in and you tweak whatever you're doing there. So we made a simple change from like a still image to a, to a GIF, um, which is like an, an animated, and it's GIF, not GIF. <laughs> I don't know if y'all seen that commercial, but every time that commercial comes on, it's GIF. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and that helped it, it move above benchmark because people were more engaged with that type of content. So as we see like things, people's, um, I guess what they like shifts. And so before, like movies didn't get as much engagement as, and by movies I mean like videos didn't get as much engagement as still pictures. And now we're seeing that animated images get better engagement sometimes too. Uh, Cal Water Services Group has uh, Hawaii areas of uh, management and I, I, and I'm not 100% sure about Maui and where on Maui, but I just wanted to ask about that. With the Lahaina fire? Yes. Yeah, so we actually do serve, we serve on the Big Island, on Maui, and on Oahu. On Maui, we serve, our, we serve three larger areas on Maui. One is Pukulani, which did have another fire that was nearby, and we have a wastewater system in Pukulani. Um, so we won't talk about that, but we also serve Kanapali, which is just north of Lahaina. Uh, and then we also serve Kapalua, which is north of Kanapali. So we, the, the fire itself did not touch our systems because we were a couple miles up from Lahaina, but our systems were severely impacted because all the power was out, all the communication was out. We couldn't get, couldn't get a hold of people on the island to see if our own local crews were safe. So our local um, operations manager had a had a challenging time getting in touch with each of 
uh, his team members on the island because they couldn't communicate. Texting was down, cell service was down, all of that. Um, and we were running on generator power for about a week um, in Kanapali and in Kapalua, there are still ongoing issues with the grid. So one of the issues that came about having to be on generator power is everybody's on generator power and all the hotels are on generator power and all of these generators have to keep getting diesel to be able to operate. So there, there was a lot happening behind the scenes on our operation side getting fuel to keep refueling our generators day after day after day so that we could keep our customers in water. Because if we could keep our customers in water and with the fire having not physically touched our system, we didn't have to issue any boil water advisories because the water was still safe. And we were conducting, just out of an abundance of caution, additional water quality tests just to allay concerns that may come up because obviously they had to test for that in Lahaina. Um, so, so there was, there were a lot of issues. We had our emergency operations system uh, center open for about two weeks to support to support this. And what was interesting, so I'm kind of going all over the place with this, but um, one of the interesting things is we have 13 employees on the island of Maui. We have about 30 ish on the Big Island. Um, they are such a tight knit group there, and this was so great to see. When, and one of the things that we always say as a company is we're one team and we're all trained the same way on our emergency operations center. So you can plug in people in different districts within California, in different states, and they'll be able to just go. Like whether it's logistics or planning or liaison or whatever. Um, so when we had our, when we had our, our uh, sorry, I can't even talk. I had so much food, it was really good. And so now I'm like, half brain dead. Um, our Hawaii, our big island Hawaii folks wanted to help our Maui folks so much because they just, you know, they're a family there. So what they did was we needed to relieve the people who were on Maui because they were working 24 hours a day to try to make sure that our systems were still running properly. So we had our Big Island folks going over to Maui when flights resumed to be able to relieve them. And then we had California folks and even one from New Mexico who um, was, is a wastewater treatment plant expert. We were backfilling our Big Island folks, you know, so that our Hawaii team could help our Hawaii team. But really we all work together and so California folks went into Hawaii and then we were doing things remote because now we have Zoom. So there were a lot of, a lot of issues. Um, another communication specific issue that came up um, with the fire is that the county of Maui serves the Lahaina water system. But when you say count Maui County, you sometimes think the entire county of Maui. They had to issue a boil water advisory. So there was a lot of confusion with who was under a, a water quality issue and who was not. Um, and then at a time where communication is still spotty, like whether people could get internet, whether people could get text messages, um, whether people could get their email. So we were pushing out messaging to all of our customers um, multiple times over these days through all of these channels, including Facebook too, because you don't know how somebody's gonna be able to even access it. Not just how they would normally receive it, but how they could like physically access it during this time um, so that people would know that their water is safe even though they're in the county of Maui. They're not served by the county of Maui. Well, thank you. That, uh, thank you, that was a... Uh, 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 you said you're all over the place, but uh, I think in doing so, you covered uh, covered everything. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it seems like with that, there increasingly there's increasing evidence that uh, well, I, I mean, it's pretty intuitive that wildfires and water systems don't mix, but it's it sounds like there's increasing evidence that it's the impacts are a lot worse than I even thought, and uh, uh, so. Um, that, that's kind of a good good story uh, you're telling. Uh, are there any questions? There's one more, and I can come to you with. Thank you. So um, I have a question about how you're reaching customers and how your customer interactions have been. Have you been using ChatGPT or any of the new la large language models to help refine the messaging or improve your messaging? 
So for various security reasons, we don't have AI on a wide scale basis within our company um, yet. I'll be sure to ask. We're that investigating that. ways that we can use AI to help with content generation just so that we can do more and push more out. Like, for example, we'd love to do a customer newsletter, but can we do 20 some odd customer newsletters that are all district specific? Because that's what people care about is what's happening in their neighborhood. Um, so we're looking into that right now, but we're, our IT team has to do a lot of security investigation on their end to make sure that nothing could be compromised within our systems. And we have very strict limitations on what we can use it for um, and what we cannot use it for, like no, no PII, no, no data that is not yet public, like water quality data, we can forget that because until it's like approved and, and issued. Um, so we're looking at ways we can use AI to augment our efforts, but it's very slow going on our end just because of the security concerns. And I'll mention one other thing about Hawaii while I'm thinking about it. So I really am all over the place. Um, our Maui team was so heroic during this time because while they're trying to keep the water system running, a number of our employees actually lived in Lahaina. So we actually had employees who lost their homes, who lost everything. And they, you know, of course they made sure that their families were safe. But then they were out working on the water system to make sure that our customers stayed in water. So that was just, it just showed how much working for, which we're known as Hawaii Water Service out there, how much it meant to them and how importantly they took their job. Yvonne Kingman, thank you.